Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the Newark Public Library, welcome. I'm Tom Ankner, the head of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center at the library. I hope everyone is staying warm and dry in all of the snow. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to be hosting this book talk by author William A. Penniston. William will be discussing his new book, Images of America, Newark Museum of Art. The book is an illustrated history of one of Newark's most enduring institutions. After William's talk, he will be answering questions. If you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. We will get to as many as possible. William A. Penniston is the longtime librarian of the Newark Museum of Art. He began there in 1995. He retired from full-time work at the museum in 2021, but still goes in once a week. William, a native of Oregon, has a bachelor's degree in history from Lewis and Clark College in Portland. He later obtained a Master of Library Science and Master of Arts in History from the University of Maryland. His PhD in history is from the University of Rochester in New York. He is the author, editor, or translator of eight previous books. The, the work he will be discussing tonight was published in November. It is my pleasure to introduce William A. Penniston. William? Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so let me begin by telling you that this is not the history that I wanted to write. I had to, um, I had to write it with the requirements of the press in mind, a uh, minimum amount of text and a maximum amount of photographs. I also was advised to avoid photographs of objects. This was not to be a collection handbook, but a nostalgic history that concentrated on past activities. And the past was to be the focus, not the present. There were also other limitations that I encountered. My original two-part 12-chapter chronological outline had to be reduced to eight thematic chapters. Each chapter was only to be one page of text and the rest to be of photographs and captions. And each caption had to be 50 to 70 words long. That was quite a challenge. Each page was only to have one or two photographs, uh, although on several, I wanted to have more than one to two. I found so many good ones in the archives that it was hard to, to limit myself. And then there was the limitations of the archives. I used the Newark Museum of Arts uh, Library and Archives of which I was the librarian and uh, archivist for 25 years before my retirement in 2021. The archives are a remarkable collection of exhibition histories, education documentation, and administrative records. It is particularly rich in photographs and printed materials. It does have its gaps, however. Consequently, there were certain collections or exhibitions or activities that I wanted to discuss, but I could not find any images, neither in photographic form, uh, which the press preferred, nor in visually appealing documents, which the press told me to avoid as much as possible. I did not always follow the press's advice, so I did include visually appealing photo or uh, documents. Visually appealing was, of course, the top criteria for both the photographs and the documents. And sometimes I, I couldn't find really good images. Nevertheless, I did manage to cover over 100 years of history, and I did manage to include 200 photographs. Some of them are truly wonderful. Next, please. For example, who could resist this image of a boy examining an old fashioned bicycle from 1931 and the poster? That's wonderful. The book is divided into seven thematic captions or seven thematic chapters, uh, leaders, American art or the art of the contemporary, the industrial applied and decorative arts, a global perspective, the natural sciences, education, and the campus. Each chapter was arranged chronological, uh, and each one covered over a, 
a century of history. That too was challenging. My final chapter was uh, labeled New Beginnings and it covered the last 10 years. It became in many ways a shameless means of self promote or institutional promotion. And that too was probably a no-no with the press, but the press allowed me to get away with it. Next, John Cotton Dana was the founding director of the Newark Museum, serving as its first director from 1909 to 1929. Museums, he once declared, were designed to give pleasure, to make manners seem more important, to promote skill, to exalt handiwork, and to increase the, z the zest of life by adding to it new interests. Consequently, he dreamed of developing a group of museums in the field of art, science, and industry of the modern type. In 1909, he managed to convince a group of businessmen, professionals, and civic leaders to establish the Newark Museum Association in a successful attempt to do just that, to bring his dream to life. Uh, next. Dana once wrote, if we wish a renaissance of art in America, we must be students and patrons of endeavors, which seem humble, but which are in truth of the utmost importance. Consequently, he worked with collectors, donors, and trustees who were interested in the fine arts. And together they put together a remarkable collection of American paintings and sculpture. He was particularly interested in contemporary artists like Child Hassam, the famous uh, Impressionist, Mark Max Weber, the uh, Modernist, Bryson Burroughs, and Rudolf Ruzicka, all of whom had solo exhibitions in 1911, 1913, 1915, and 1917, respectively. These were some of the first exhibitions of living American artists in any American museum. This photograph is from the 1917 solo exhibition of Rudolf Ruzicka's works. He was a, trained as a commercial artist and became a much sought after wood engraver for special projects. One of these special projects was a series of engravings on work about Newark. This was commissioned by the Carteret Book Club, which was an exclusive private book club um, devoted to book collectors. Uh, Dana was a member. In this stage photograph, Dana appears at the far left with Chester uh, Hogg, chairman of the board of trustees and co-owner of the metal makers Whitehead and Hogg in the back. The two women seated are Beatrice Windsor, uh, the assistant director on the left, and Louise Connolly, the chief educator on the right. The two standing women in the background, I have no idea who they are. Next. Despite this emphasis on American painting and sculpture, Dana's major interest was in the industrial applied and decorative arts. That is to say, objects from daily life with an emphasis on contemporary design. And he did not limit his interest to the United States alone. Over the two decades that he led the Newark Museum, he mounted several exhibitions that established a, tra a tradition of looking at mass-produced objects of high quality that were readily available to the discerning customer. Toward the end of a lot of his life, he declared beauty has no relationship to price, rarity, or age. And he illustrated this concept in three exhibitions entitled Inexpensive Objects of Good Design. Hat making, along with the making of dresses, suits, ties, shirts, and other clothing uh, 
made of sewn or uh, knitted materials made up the textile industries of New Jersey, uh, an exhibit in uh, 1916. Uh, other exhibits included Next, The Pottery of Newark, Flemington and uh, Trenton, Next, the Leather Products of New Jersey. And by the way, you'll see one of our foreign visitors in this photograph. And next, the Jewelry Industry of Newark. Next, Dana's concept of objects of good design expanded the globe. They were part of an art of everyday life that took different forms at different times in different places. Collecting and displaying them gave local citizens insight into other lands and other peoples. Natsuki Inru and Ojimi, along with other Japanese art objects, were acquired in 1909 when the city of Newark gave the funds to the New Museum Association to purchase the George T. Rockwell collection. This is the poster for that exhibition and that collection. And surprisingly enough, it includes an original Japanese print. Next. Upon the death of Edward N. Crane, a museum trustee, the museum acquired his collection of Tibetan art objects in 1911. This included books, religious relics, clothing, weapons, and other uh, household objects, as well as paintings and sculpture. This photograph was taken in 1930s, in the 1930s, and uh, it displays another significant part of the museum's mission, and that is education, which we'll come to in a little later. Next. Native American textiles, potteries, and baskets were on display in 1913 and again in 1927, which is when this ex photograph is from. The museum displayed these objects here, all from the native peoples of the Eastern woodlands. The canoe, for example, was one of the major forms of transportation. Next. The exhibition Primitive African Art in 1928 and uh, Islands of the Pacific in 1929 showcased domestic objects of innovative artistry along with traditional ritual objects in the fine and decorative arts. This photograph is from the Primitive African Art Exhibition. Next, China, the land and the people, promoted understanding and commerce between the, the, the United States and China. It was an exhibit in, at the Newark Public Library when the museum was still there in 1923. These two Chinese Americans demonstrate the, mu the music of the Titsu, a flute like instrument on the left, and the Yan Qin, a type of dulcimer on the right. Next. The Natural Science Collection opened on the top floor of the Newark Public Library in 1904 before the Newark Museum Association was even founded. It was comprised of rocks and min minerals collected and arranged and described by Dr. William S. Disbro, a local pharmacist and a general practitioner. Over the years, he added plant specimens for the study of botany and animal specimens for the study of zoology. By the time of his death in 1922, the collection consisted of 74,000 specimens, and all of them were bequeathed to the Newark Museum. Newark needs a science museum, Dana wrote in 1905, a small practical museum made up chiefly of objects 
illustrating the geology, soil, flora, and fauna of this vicinity. The photograph on the right shows a display of uh, marbles, polished, either polished or rough, alongside um, rocks and minerals, geodes and crystals, and coral and shells. The photograph on the left shows a curator examining a butterfly from the, uh, uh, from the uh, insect collection. Next. Uh, our Newark Museum, Dana wrote in 1921, should be the handmaidens of our schools, helping to discover among our thousands of young people those tastes and talents which may lead them to such accomplishments as will bring profit, credit, and civility to our city. Toward that end, he encouraged teachers to bring their students to the museum for both formal and informal instruction. Next. In addition, he founded the Lending Collection in 1912 to take art objects and science specimens out into classrooms as teaching aids. Would this model ship, for example, help this young man, no doubt a, a teacher, teach students about the age of exploration. Next. In 1913, he founded the Junior Museum to serve as an after-school program, a club that held classes, took field trips, mounted exhibitions, and put on theatrical pageants in the garden behind the museum. In this photograph, one club member shows off his clay sculpture to his instructor and his fellow club members. Next. For the first 17 years of its existence, the Newark Museum was located on the fourth floor of the Newark Public Library. One room was devoted to the natural science collection, while the other one was used for special exhibitions in the fine arts and the decorative arts. Uh, by the 1920s, it had clearly outgrown uh, its space uh, due to the generosity of Louis Bamberger, the department store owner, who was also a trustee of the museum and a benefactor, a modest building three stories tall, totaling 64,000 square feet, was constructed on Washington Park, now Henry Harriet Tubman Square. This was close to downtown Newark. It was not the kind of museum building that now oppresses us in uh, uh, John Cotton Dana's words, by which he meant temples and palaces in remote parks. Rather, it was a, an elegant and functional architectural gem that was easily accessible to the citizens of Newark. Since then, the campus has expanded to include three buildings, one historic mansion, two carriage houses, one stone schoolhouse, and one garden. Next. This quick overview of the founding years of the Newark Museum's history under the leadership of John Cotton Dana uh, gives you an idea of the main areas of concentration that the Newark Museum of Art has concentrated on for over a, a, a century. Since in his death in 1929, it has changed and adapted to meet the challenges of the intervening years. Those challenges included, next, the depression and the second world war. This photograph shows a museum educator taking her skills directly to the men and women in the armed forces. In this case, two young men at the art corner of the United Services Organization, the USO, in downtown Newark. Next. 
the post-war years of peace and prosperity, which allowed the museum to expand its staff with young professionals. Uh, these young professionals increased the collections through purchases and donations, and they developed um, pedagogical and thematic exhibitions. Uh, these photographs are uh, photographic portraits are of William Gertz, curator of American art from 1954 to 1966, who became a leader, uh, a leading scholar of American Impressionism. Um, uh, J. Stuart Johnson, who was the curator of decorative arts from 1964 to 1966 and went on to to a stellar career at the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Eleanor Olson, who was curator of America, of Asian art from 1950 to 1970. Uh, Kenneth uh, Gosner, who was the curator of the natural sciences from 1945 to 1980. And he, by the way, was a talented artist who illustrated his own books. Next. The rebellion of 1966 and the financial crisis of 1969 forced the museum to rethink its mission. Uh, and so co consequently, for example, there was an awful lot of outreach to other communities within the city. This photograph is from the 1969 African Festival which accompanied two exhibitions, Art of Africa, which emphasized traditional artistic expressions and black motion, which focused on contemporary local artists. Next. The uh, museum's renovation or renovation program of the 1980s allowed a new museum to emerge in the 1990s and the 2000s. This photograph is of the Junior Museum's exhibition, uh, Stepping into Ancient Egypt. Uh, the Junior Museum Gallery was a new space in the new educational center that in, now called the South Wing, and it invited the youngest members of the museum's audience to travel across time and space and to learn about uh, different cultures. Stepping into ancient Greece, ancient Egypt was um, focused around the house of Pashed, an artist. So it looked at his family life, his daily life, his household activities, and most importantly, his artistic endeavors. Uh, this chronological arrangement from the Great Depression of the 1930s to the Great Recession of the 2010s had to be abbreviated and slotted into the five themes identified it above. American art, decorative arts, global cultures, natural science, and education. Along the way, I did not neglect the leaders and the changing nature of the campus of in those years. Next. For my ch final chapter, New Beginnings, I looked at the remarkable innovations currently taping, taking shape at the Newark Museum of Art. But for that, you will need to plan your own trip to 49 Washington Street in downtown Newark. Thank you for your time. Thank you, William. Just to get, okay. All right, well, thank you, William. That was terrific. Uh, that was great. So um, just a few things that I wanted to ask. Um, so your book is an illustrated uh, history of the Newark Museum of Art. You did mention at the beginning of your presentation where you got many of the images. Did you get all of them from the Newark Museum's collection or do they come from other sources as well? They all came from the Newark Museum's archives. Okay. All right. And how long did it take you to uh, work on the book? 
Um, <laughs> well, uh, I would say 25 years. <laughs> it's the calm, it really is the culmination of, 20, of, of a 25 year career of learning about the museum, being its archivist, learning about its history. Um, and I had done a number of, um, I had done um, his uh, blogs on the histories throughout my career. I wrote a, a, a little essay uh, for a selected works, which was a handbook that we did for our uh, centennial in 2009. I um, put together a collection of Dana's writings for our 90th anniversary and um 1999 so, so there were a number of things that I did but um from the time that I proposed this uh proposal to the press till the time I submitted the manuscript was only about 6 months oh wow oh, that's that's fast <laughs> well yes but as i said i had a lot of yeah. uh, had a yeah. lot of stuff already written so you had you had all the, of I didn't have all of the photographs selected though. <laughs> but so you had this book in mind for a while then before you actually proposed it. Then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a um, few questions from the attendees. Uh, when the museum was founded, did it charge admission? No, it did not because we, uh, and in fact, we uh, have no, we've only been charging admission to um, non-residents of Newark within the last, I would say, five to ten years. Um, we, um, we did not charge admission because we were a tax supported, um, organ, uh, museum funded primarily more than 50% of our, our funding comes from the city of Newark. Okay. Um, so does the museum's collection include color photos? Uh, and if so, how are they preserved? Uh, we have, uh, we have some color photos um uh they are preserved uh they are preserved as uh slides as transparencies and sometimes as prints uh and also as digital images um since the, the last for the last 10 to 15 years uh, it has been digital photography that is preserved and um Yes, and that I mean a lot of the 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 newer stuff has all been foot fo uh, color photography. Curiously enough, the this the press did not want the, this press does not use color photography at all. The, everything is going to be black and white, so that everything in this book is black and white. Okay, um, so. Uh... As how did John Cotton Dana rally Newark leaders to support the art museum? Were his lending art initiatives welcomed or criticized? Um, <laughs> um some of his um uh, so one of the early works, one of the early exhibits that he did was the, uh, the Max Weber show. Um, and Max Weber is a modernist, uh, rather abstract in his uh, approach. And people did not really understand, um, they didn't really understand that ex exhibition. Um, and he was highly criticized, but he came, he was very, he, he came out very strongly saying that we should be supporting uh, living American artists and Max Weber is one of them. Curiously enough, by 1959, uh, the museum had a retrospective of Max Weber's works, um, and that was very successful. Uh, by then, uh, uh, abstract um, expressionism, uh, modern art was all the rage, and it was very well received. Uh, in 1911, Child Hassam had an ex ex a solo exhibition um, and Hassam is an American impressionist, and his work was much better, much well better received. So um, the other thing about John Cotton Dana was that he had several um, well-known businessmen who who were 
collectors in and of themselves, like Arthur Ag Egner, who was a, a collector and served as our chairman of the board for many years in the 1920s. Um, and he was a great supporter. Um, um, Carolyn Bamberger Fold was another major uh, supporter. She offered to buy $10,000 worth of paintings for the opening of the museum in 1926. And uh, Dana told her to uh, consult with Holger Cahill so that, so Miss, Mrs. Fold and Holger Cahill went around Greenwich Village to galleries and bought art. Um, yeah. Cahill, by the way, is an important figure in American um, in American art. He was the head. He from the he was our publicist at the Newark Museum of Art for many years. Um, and from that, he went on to be the director of the Federal Arts Project for the WPA. Oh, okay. Uh, would you talk generally about the Ballantine House? Uh, that was one question we have. Okay, the Ballantine House was purchased in, um, well, it was um, sold by the family to an insurance company in, in 1920, I think it was. Uh, and the insurance company built the, um, the, the office building in the back, no, no, the North Wing, and used that as their offices um that used the mansion uh for receptions and board meetings and uh kept it re in remarkably good shape in 1937 it sold it to the newark museum association and the museum used it as office space as well for example the director's office was on the second floor uh the parlor was the um the uh, telephone operator's room. Um, and up until 1976, when the museum uh, for the bicentennial restored the mansion, especially the first floor, the first floor was open to the public in 1976. Uh, the second floor was open to the public uh, in 1994. Uh, and then just recently, the exterior of the house had to be, uh, um, the sandstone was degrading and, uh, and a lot of work needed to be done to restore that. So there's, this is the third restoration of the house. And, um, and it just uh, opened in November with a, 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 a new kind of, take on on life in Newark in the 19th century. Um, there are three rooms on the second floor that, that were used as a decorative arts gallery space and are still being used uh, for new um, uh, special exhibits. Okay. So uh, another person brings up something that um, kind of follows up on a question of mine. As a child growing up in Newark in the 60s and 70s, I spent a great many days at the Newark Museum. During those years, the museum had wonderful art, but also science and history exhibits. Uh, this person is asking if they if it is now only art, uh, which I think uh, was brought up when the Newark Museum renamed itself about five years ago. Can you talk a little bit about the renaming and why that was and whether it still has things that are not art, the items that are not art? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, we, for, you know, for over a hundred years, we were known as the Newark Museum. Uh, and the problem with that name is that people didn't exactly know what we were. Um, they thought, oh, are you the, the museum of the city of Newark, uh, a history museum, which we have never really been. We have been Primarily, I've always said we are a museum of fine arts, decorative arts, and the natural sciences. Um, over the top of our um, building are the words art, science, and industry. And if you understand industry as the uh, in as the decorative arts, I think the, those words still apply. For Dana, industry, as I tried to 
uh, um, I, it, it was it was the uh, industrial applied and decorative arts. Um, so um, it, it could in, include fine uh, crafts as well as uh, everyday objects of good design. Um, the natural science uh, collection um, in the 1990s, even in when I was there in the 2000s was was a, had a very we had a strong um, science department and we had good exhibits and um, um, and we still have the third floor is still devoted to um, um, uh, science. Uh, we're taking a more uh, innovative, a more interactive approach to um, the sciences on that third floor. Uh, but the reason why we changed the, the name is because um, we wanted to highlight that we are primarily an, a fine arts and decorative arts museum. But you also have a planetarium too attached. We to also have a planetarium too. Very yes. nice planetarium, yes. Um, so are there other libraries in the country that have museums attached to them? <clears throat> Excuse me, that have museums attached to them? It's a other pretty unusual li libraries. Thing. Libraries, yes. And the, you know, in the early days of the museum, it was. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that for sure, but I think we were very unique. Um, yeah, I I am not aware of any other museum that was founded in a library. Um, I am also unaware of any other um, museum whose first three directors were librarians. John Cotton Dana, he was not trained as a librarian, but he was he was uh, um, the librarian at the Denver Public Library, at the Springfield, Massachusetts Public Library, and then at the Newark Public Library uh, from 1889 until his death in 1929. So for 40 years, he was a, a, a librarian. Uh, Beatrice Windsor was trained as a librarian at Melville Dewey's uh, school at Columbia University before it moved to Albany. Uh, she was hired to be a cataloger, became assistant director of the library, and then director of the library and the museum. Um, and, be it, uh, and Alice Kendall was also hired as a cataloger. She was trained at uh, Simon's Rock. I think that's the school in Boston, the library school in Boston. I may be wrong about that. Um, but she was trained as a cataloger and hired as a cataloger, but switched to the museum right away and was one of the first employees of the museum, became a curator, assistant director, and then director for the last two years of her 38 year career at the museum. So we are unique in that regard. We are also unique in that uh, I think five of our eight directors have been women. Oh, that is, that's unusual. So uh, why does the museum have such large and extensive holdings of Tibetan art and key works by Joseph Stella? Does this reflect curator choices, Dana's personal interests, or the collecting preferences of wealthy donors to the museum? Okay. Um, the Tibetan art collection uh, came to the museum uh, from uh, the, this trustee, Edward Crane. Um, and curiously enough, he, it's an interesting story. He was on a ship in 1910 coming back from Japan and he met a, a missionary doctor who was coming back from Tibet. And this, this missionary doctor was Dr. Shelton and he was bringing back with him all of these uh, Tibetan artifacts. And he was planning to sell these artifacts in the United States to help raise funds for his missionary work because he was going back to, this was his sabbatical. So he's going back after a year. Uh, Crane said, I will give you, I, I can, I'll give you an exhibit of these um, works at, at the Newark Museum, which took place in 1911. Uh, he then purchased the collection. He then died suddenly and his family donated the collection to the Newark Museum. 
And once we began, once we had that collection, then other people who collected Tibetan art, a lot of the missionaries too, were, began to send us their collect their objects. And so we be, we had we be, had a, we began this whole series. And throughout the 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 nineteen tens, the nineteen twenties, the nineteen thirties, and the nineteen forties, we collected um, Tibetan art, and we've continued to do that. Uh, today, our Tibetan collection is one of the best, probably the largest in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so, um, long story there, a, a trustee there. Joseph Stella, interestingly enough, did not come to our um, museum until the 1930s. Uh, so it was Beatrice Windsor that was actually responsible for that purchase. Uh, the five panels, uh, City of the Voice of New York Interpreted, oh, yeah. Yeah. came in 1937. And in 1939, she uh, convinced him to have an exhibit, a, a solo exhibit of his works. Um, and I think several other pieces came in at that point. So that was... Um, that was a Beatrice win. I don't think it was necessarily her personal um, interest, but um, it was a, I think that was a, a, a connection she made through uh, one of the local galleries here in Newark who was representing him or one of the local galleries in, in, uh, in New York. Can you talk about the reasons behind and significance of the museum's decision to deaccession some pieces from its collection within the past few years? Um, let's see. Um, one of the main reasons was we decided to look at our collections and um, and figure out where we had. Um, what we call redundancies and by that it's not it's like works by the same artists or works in the same field or similar that um that were uh that we didn't really need to have all of these um things for example we had six thomas coles and we had several uh, which represented uh, um, Roman and Greek ruins in Europe that uh, th the same theme was illustrated in several of those. Um, so we decided to deaccession one of them. We had uh, some of the, uh, we had uh, many, many uh, Hudson River schools that we decided, well, we have just too many. And so it would make more sense if we, uh reduce the number um a lot of our paintings uh do not uh are are in storage simply because we don't have the space to store to show them all and um and you know so that was that was the thinking behind that so if dana were alive today what do you think his priorities for the museum would be uh, the, I think Dana would uh, would agree with uh, Linda Harrison that the priority is to get people in the door and um, uh, yes, to get people in the door. Mm -hmm. Can the public access the photo collection? No, not no. <laughs> um, I before I retired, I made a whole proposal that we should, you know, somehow figure out a way to digitize our archives, especially the photo archives. But of course, I retired, and um, and the museum is still facing some financial issues. Uh, in planning to replace me this year, um, and maybe that new librarian archivist will undertake a, 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 digit, a digitization project um, and make these uh, photographs and some of the uh, documents, like the posters, uh, 
more readily available. Um, yes, I think that I, I think this that would be a great um, project. Okay. So it's mainly um, uh, just a lack of access because of staffing that there is. It's a lack of access due to staffing. Yes. Um, how was the opening of the Newark Museum presented to the public at large? I believe uh, this, he's probably asking about the 1926 opening, probably the, when the new building, when the building opened, separate building opened. Um, okay. <laughs> um, it was a very well received. Uh, it was covered in the press. There was a, a, a whole section devoted to the opening of the museum in the uh, Sunday, the Newark Sunday Call. Um, uh, a big a big celebratory opening night where Mayor Raymond spoke and John Cotton Dana spoke and um, uh, the, it, the, there are wonderful photographs of uh, the audience and the it's right in the the court and the court is packed so i, I think it was very well received um that uh the initial exhibit was the um the collection that uh mrs fold had purchased for the a museum uh something you know those living american artists and their paintings and that was ex very well received what was the same and what was different in Dana's philosophy for the museum versus the library? That is, did he try to do things with the museum that he didn't try in the library? Um, I think he, I think his philosophy was pretty much the same. Um, it was about access. I think he, fundamentally, I think Dana's philosophy is based on, uh, it can be reduced to this simple thing. Some people learn through books and hence they needed libraries and other people learned through objects and hence they needed museums. Um, and I think that he felt that, that uh, at that time, Newark was uh, more than 50% of, of the population was uh, immigrants, first or second generation. Um, Many of them were um, becoming citizens. So he felt that there was a need for these people to be able to learn about uh, American painting and culture and and the decorative arts was one way to do it. Um, uh, books, pamphlets, uh, periodicals. Um, he was a big promoter of um, democracy in all kinds of forms. I, I think that uh, this notion of everyday objects of good design is one way to look at how his notion of the democratization of art. I think the library is the democratization of uh, information. Okay. How is the museum grappling, or is it grappling, with the realities of museums having to return objects to locations from which they have been taken? The museum uh, underwent several years ago an extensive um, review of our Native American collection, and uh, and especially just before we reopened those galleries in 2017, we, we worked with a, a um, we worked with a an outside curator who was very well known in the field. We also worked closely with uh, the Native American tribes that these objects belong to, uh, and we we returned what they requested. Um, it, curiously enough, this whole process uh, d demonstrated that a lot of them were very they were very pleased to have our uh, their objects in our museum and were wanting to make sure that the they were treated with respect and with uh, culturally sensitive inter interpretations um so we we I actually I think we did a pretty good job with with them um 
Okay. Right. Um, what percentage of the museum's holdings are in basement storage and how much is on public display? Uh, how does the museum decide what kinds of art to put on display or in storage? Um, I don't really know the answer to that question, how much. Um, I really couldn't, I couldn't even take a guess. Um, uh, what gets placed on uh, exhibition uh, is determined by the curators and um, and it really depends on what they want to emphasize, um, how they want to approach their galleries. Um, so the the um, the one example, for example, the um, when you're dealing with uh, uh, paperwork, uh, drawings, uh, watercolors, that sort of thing, they're very light sensitive and they have to be rotated quite frequently. In our Asian gallery, our Asian curator rotated th those um, objects once a year. And she always picked a theme. It was monkeys and mountains, or it was dragons, or it was uh, phoenixes, or it was um, birds. Or um, so she would pick a, a a theme and then find uh, uh, objects that uh, showed that theme. That's how she uh, approached her galleries. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more question. What were now? You mentioned this during your your talk, but um, I think this person wants a little more detail. What were some of the outreach activities undertaken after the sixty seven rebellion? Um, you mentioned an African art show, but were there other things that you know of that? that yeah, um, the African art show, um, the African festival, African symposium, uh, all that took place then. There was um, a lot of outreach to, 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 um, um, with the African-American community. Um, and that um, we did a major show called uh, Against the Odds, which um, uh, looked at the Harmon Foundation, which is a, a foundation of uh, devoted entirely to African-American art. Um, we hosted that uh we hosted one of their exhibitions in the 1930s and in 1990. We had this uh, retrospective uh, show called uh, Against the Odds. And that book, that exhibition is still considered one of the leading scholarly uh, overviews of the Harmon Foundation. Um, we also, uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, under the direction of uh, Mary Sue Sweeney Price, we did a, a number of other things. For example, um, with the Latin American community, we engaged uh, uh, Pepan Osario to do a um, installation in the North Ward uh, called um, Badge of Honor, which looked at the, the um, he was interested in the the, the, in, the impact of incarceration on uh, Latin American families, uh, and so this was a father's prison cell and a teenager's uh, bedroom. Uh, it, it was in a storefront in the North Ward. It then moved to the museum where it was on display for almost a year. Um, in uh, um, the era of 2004, I believe it was, we engaged with the uh, Indian community of New Jersey uh, and did this uh, show called India, uh, um, Private Spaces, Public, no, Public Space, oh, well, oh, I forget the subtitle. <laughs> But in any case, that looked at contemporary um, uh, contemporary uh, video installations from India uh, and the Indian community of Edison and elsewhere, New, uh, New Jersey City, and we they were we engaged with them to uh, in on a number of different. Uh, areas 
Um, so those are a couple of things that we did. Okay. And there's actually is one more question. Can the public bring objects in to be evaluated? Uh, no, they cannot. <laughs> that is, um, and you cannot, and our, I don't exactly understand the reason. Uh, the, 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 it's considered a conflict of interest for the curators to be evaluating art. I, um, so hmm. okay. they're not, legally, they're not allowed to do that. Well, they could, they could, I guess they could say, well, no, this isn't worth anything, but we'll buy it from you for 10 bucks. And then it's actually worth like, you know, a lot of, a lot more money. Uh, I think that's, that's, maybe that's the concern. Yeah. yeah. That's, or, or they, they, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Something like that. Okay. Well, thank you, William. And thank you to all of our participants tonight. This was a terrific talk. Uh, so good night, everyone. Please stay warm. On behalf of the Newark Public Library, I'm Tom Ankner. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye.